Welcome back. In our last lecture, we introduced the notion of lattice-based security and talked about the meta policy for the Bell and Lepadula system. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today in this lecture. In particular, you know, we said that the set of labels within a Bell and Lepadula system form a lattice, which is an algebraic structure. Here's a very simple example of a lattice. Suppose we only had labels H and L, standing for high and low. And um, the meta policy, if we had a Bell and Lepadula system for this uh, set of labels, should be that information can flow from low to high, but shouldn't be allowed to flow from high to low. That's what we want to accomplish. And so we put these rules in place, simple security and the star property, to prevent information from flowing, say, from high to low, which is in violation of the meta policy. And what we're going to ask today is, do they do the job? Is there any way in which information could flow from high to low, even if we have those rules in place? OK, so let's consider a particular system. Uh, that is a, a set of operations which we might perform in our, in our uh, sort of thought experiment simple BLP system. Well, we need read and write, right? Um, and so suppose that we introduce the operations read and write with the following semantics. So read says that uh, S tries to read a particular object O. If that object exists and the level of the subject dominates the level of the object, which is what simple security requires, then we return to S the value of that object. And what happens if that fails? Otherwise, return a zero. Um, and then write, the semantics of that is, we have three parameters, the subject, the object, and a value. And if the object exists and the level of the subject is dominated by the level of the object, which is what the star property requires, that we change the value of the object to its new value v, otherwise we don't do anything. Now, I think that you can uh, think about these, these uh, operations for a few minutes and convince yourself that they're perfectly reasonable operations from the perspective of Bell and Lepadula. Well, just to make things interesting, let's add two new operations, and these operations are create and destroy where a subject creates or destroys an object, right? So what's the semantics of create? Well, uh, the, the creating subject has to specify a name for the object it's creating, and that's O. So here's, here are the semantics. If no object of that name exists anywhere on the system, then create a new object with that name at the subject's level. Seems innocuous. Otherwise, if uh, an object with that name already exists, we don't do anything. OK, so that's create. Destroy works sort of similarly. If an object with the name O exists and the subject has right access to it, then destroy the object. Otherwise, don't do anything. Now, if you think about these guys, uh, they're a little bit different from read and write. And since, you know, Bell and Lepadula's rules, simple security and the star property, were explicitly about read and write, we have to stretch our minds a little bit to decide whether these are legal. But they seem to be. They don't seem to violate the, uh, the principles or the, uh, the desired goals of Bell and Lepadula. OK, but now we have this simple system with four operations that we can perform. Read, write, create, and destroy. So imagine that we write a couple of programs. Well, in the program on the left, uh, a high-level subject, SH, creates an object with name FO. Assume that it doesn't exist already on, this, on, on the uh, system, right? And then a low-level subject, SL, tries to do some stuff, okay? And so what does SL try to do? Well, it tries to create a subject, or excuse me, an object with that same name. And what's going to happen? Well, that's going to fail because the semantics of create says that we can't create an object if an, if an existing object already has that name, right? And so what happens then? Well, the low-level subject tries to write to that object, and that succeeds, actually, because there's an existing high-level object, and he can write up. So he writes a 1 to it. But then he tries to read that object, and the read fails because the, the object is not uh, accessible for him to read because it's at a higher level. 
So he gets back a zero, which is the semantics of the read operation, right? Let's look at the other side of this chart, okay? In that case, uh, the high-level subject didn't do anything. He didn't try to create the subject, excuse me, the object. And so when the low-level subject tries to create, his create succeeds. He writes a value to that object. It's at his level. He reads the value back, sees a one, and, and, and then we have this additional destroy at the bottom, but we'll think about that later. Um, but on the left-hand side, the low-level subject, when he tries to do the read, gets a, gets a zero back. And on the right-hand side, when the low-level subject tries to do the read, he gets a one back. So what's the, uh, what's the upshot of this? Well, depending upon what the high-level subject has done, either creating the object or not, the low-level subject sees different values. And so I would claim that by using this mechanism, the high-level subject was able to signal one bit of information to the low-level subject. So, in a sense, who cares, right? It's just one bit of information. But it's a proof of concept that even though we argued that this, our simple system with these four operations satisfies the Bell and Lepagula rules, and from a Bell and Lepagula perspective, it's a perfectly legitimate system, nevertheless, there's a flow of information from high down to low. And that shows that there must be something wrong. The other thing to notice is that, yes, they only sent one bit of information, but remember that destroy at the bottom, because in both cases the object was destroyed, they could easily go back and do this again, in fact, using the same name. And if they put it in a loop, for example, they could send arbitrary amounts of information over this channel, given enough time. Right? So what was going on here? Well, what was happening is that the Bell and the Padula system, as any access control system, has a, has a very limited notion of how information flows within the system. In particular, the way information flows, according to Bell and the Padula's view, is you write a value into an object, and then another subject reads it. Right. But that's not what's happening here. We passed a bit of information, but it wasn't the contents of any, of any object that was in question. In fact, if you think about it, the contents of the object were the same on both sides of, of, of the divide. Right? What was happening was that, that there was some system attribute which was being manipulated, and in particular, it was the level of the, ob of the object named F sub zero. And so the, the, that bit of information was really residing in the question, can SL read a particular object named O in this case, or FO, I guess. Okay, so I would make the following claim to you. If a low-level subject ever sees varying results depending upon varying actions by a high-level subject, then the two can collude to send a bit of information from high to low using that mechanism. And we call this a covert channel. So what have we said? Well, an access control policy constrains the flow of information within the system by controlling who can read and write objects. But there may be other mechanisms within the system which can be utilized to send information where it shouldn't within the system. And those channels are called covert channels. And we're going to investigate that much more in our, in our following lecture. Thank you.